Hello everyone, welcome to Darwinian Delusions. I'm Faraz Zahabi. I've been studying philosophy for over 20 years. And today I was asked by Sabur to share with you all some philosophical ideas that me and him have been uh, discussing recently. So I want to start off by saying I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Yes, philosophy can very, be very confusing and profound. However, it could also be made very simple. And that's my objective here today. Suppose I were to tell you that there are many theories on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And because there are many theories on the assassination of John F. Kennedy, they must all be wrong. By the, by the very virtue that there are many of them and they all contradict each other, they must all be wrong. If I came to such a conclusion, you'd be like, for us, that makes no sense whatsoever. Just because several of them have been proven to be wrong doesn't mean the rest must be wrong. It doesn't follow that the rest must be wrong. They may be wrong, but they could also be right. The same argument or the same counter argument should be applied when somebody says, because there are many gods, because there are many religions, they must all be wrong. Because religions say so many different things, have so many different views, they must all be wrong. Okay, so today we're going to try to clarify that, okay, not because there are many different opinions, they must all be wrong. It doesn't follow. But we also have to clarify, how would we know which religion is correct? How would we know which religion is correct? So I'm going to contend today that, like many Islamist, Islamic thinkers have in the past, that we are born with a natural religion and religion is also revealed. Okay, so we have a natural religion and religion is also revealed. These two together have to be in harmony and that's how we're going to know which religion is true and which religion is not okay so let's draw on the works of david hume i'm going to draw on the works of david hume for those of you who don't know who david hume is he is the greatest thinking atheist in history in my opinion he's the greatest thinking atheist in history he makes today's atheists seem like with all due respect um, he, he's far above them in thought, okay? In my opinion, he's far more sophisticated in thought, okay? So, what does David Hume says? He says, look, have you, he asks the question, have you ever seen a golden mountain? Have you ever seen a golden mountain? A true mountain made up of gold. Think of Mount Everest, but made of solid gold. You're going to tell me for us, no, I've never seen one. There's no such thing. Well, David Hume would agree with you. He'd say, look, golden mountains don't exist. They may exist somewhere out there in the universe. It's not impossible. However, we've never experienced one and we have no reason to believe that a golden mountain exists. He says, however, a golden mountain is composed of two very simple ideas. Okay, so we've come, in, we've come to experience gold on one hand and we've experienced mountain in the world. Okay, so when you were born, you discovered gold. You saw gold for the first time. Then you saw a mountain for the first time. And David Hume says you took these two simple ideas that you experienced out in the world and you compounded them together to make what he calls a complex idea. Now you have golden mountain. Complex ideas do not necessarily exist. However, simple ideas, gold, mountain, must exist because these two cannot be broken down any further. They're what he calls he refers to as simple ideas. A simple idea must be experienced. That's the only way you'll ever know it. Okay, so if I were to ask somebody who was blind their entire life, if I were to ask a blind man to tell me about the color red, he would be unable to. Why? Because he's simply unable to experience the color red. Now, for instance, I've never seen a red sun, a truly red sun. However, I can imagine a red sun. Why? I've experienced the color red. I've experienced the sun, what the sun is. And then I combine those two elements together. What does this have to do with theology? Well, I'm going to have to refer you now to what I call the Abrahamic experience. Okay, It's a, it's a famous passage in the Quran. Okay, This guides us. It, it points us to um, believing in only what is a simple idea, trusting only in what is a simple idea. So for instance, Abraham, of course, please remember he was doing this in jest, okay? Abraham looks at the stars and he says, the stars are my God. This is my Lord. And when the star is set, he says, no, this cannot be my Lord. Okay, this cannot be my Lord. Then he sees the moon rise and he says, no, the moon is my God. And then the moon sets, he says, the moon cannot be my God. Then he sees the sun, he says, the sun is my God. Look, the sun is even greater. 
Then the sun sets and he says, no, the, the sun is not my God. Then he realizes that, look, he's compounding his idea of God and the sun together. God is a simple idea. The sun is a simple idea. And he's combining them together. Now, like the blind man could never know about the color red. So you could never know about perfection unless you experience perfection. Okay. Um, our definition of God, we're going to, have to be very, very careful here. Okay. Because there are many definitions to God. I'm talking to you about the one, the unity, okay, the one God, no, no, nothing compounded with it, nothing. This idea of perfection, okay. Now, how do we have? How do we know that we have this idea of perfection? Well, imagine I were to talk to you about the R seven one. I want you guys to stop everything you're doing right now, and I want you to picture the R seven one. You're like, for us, what, what, what is an R7-1? What is that? Well, it's something I made up. You see, if I make up something, you cannot even refer to it. You cannot even imagine it. You cannot even enter the dialogue with me. And so it is with the idea of God. If you never experience perfection, if you've never experienced God, and, and I'm using the word God in the purest sense, Okay, not a long bearded man above the sky, not a sky God. Okay, nothing mixed into this idea of God. I'm talking about just perfection. That's why um, this is what we're calling reductionism. Okay, I'm removing any other possible ideas. Okay, think about your consciousness, not the contents of consciousness, but consciousness itself. Okay, the one, the, the, the this thing you all have experienced, because when I refer to it, you know what I'm talking about. When I talk to you about the color red, you know what I'm talking about. If you were blind your whole life, you could not know what I'm talking about. Okay. So if I were to tell you, hey, I have this uh, belief in God. And you were like, what's God? Well, what is it? I have no understanding what you're talking about. And the more I try to describe it to you, you still wouldn't be able to understand it. Then I would believe you're truly an atheist. Okay. So if I talk to, to a blind man about the color red and he tells me, look, I have no idea what you're talking about. Then I will truly believe he's blind. However, if he dialogues with me, he has to have experienced red if he's even able to acknowledge the argument. So that's why, look, I always say there's no such thing as an atheist. And I have more arguments for why I don't believe there's a such thing as true atheism. Okay, now please don't get offended. This is not an attack on atheist people, on atheists at all whatsoever. I'm just saying that, look, when we engage in the dialogue of God, by you engaging me, by, new, by you understanding the topic you're telling me that you understand and have this innate belief as well. Okay, so back to what we were saying. The most famous objection to this argument is David Hume. That's why I brought him up. And David Hume says, look, I don't believe in God. I believe you created augmentation. Now, this is a very important point. Uh, I, do, I do believe his argument is weak, but this is his best argument. Okay, he says, look, imagine when you poured water into a glass okay imagine the glass is half full you're holding a glass that's half full of water and i take water and i add more water into your glass now you're going to experience augmentation now just take this augmentation and amplify it you saw somebody who has power you augment his power you're thinking all powerful you saw someone who who's knowledgeable now you're thinking all knowledgeable let's augmentate it augment just augment whatever exists in the world augmentate it then that's going to be your god okay now this is completely wrong when re in, re in reference to God and how I'm referencing it. Now, if you believe in a sky God with a beard or a God that was a man or a God that went through a phase of augmentation, this argument could hold water against you. And he was arguing specifically against the Christian God. In my opinion, this is the God he was arguing about. In the Quran, the Quran is explicitly telling you not to mix any ideas with the idea of perfection. Okay, God, God. So if you remember the example of Abraham, Abraham went from the stars to the moon to the sun. He was augmentating. He was augmentating. The light of the stars is inferior from our perspective to the light of the moon. And the light of the moon is inferior to the light of the sun. So he was augmenting every time. And he realized that augmentation is not the God Islam is talking about. It's not the God, the one true God. The one true God is perfection and perfection by definition. You don't add or take away. There's no addition to our God. There's no augmentation. The God, when we say God is perfect, we're telling you we've never experienced perfection in the world. We've never put perfection in a test tube. We've never seen anything that's literally perfect. 
And don't forget, this argument's been made throughout the ages, from Socrates all the way to Descartes. The Islamic thinkers also made this argument as well. Okay, It's very important. They championed this argument as well. When I tell you that perfection is the God I believe in, God is the one perfection, that's why He is one. There is no composition to God. God is a pure I, a pure experience, not the contents of consciousness, but consciousness itself. Okay, that's why um, <clears throat> there's there's a, there's a lot to know about this, and I'm I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. But I want to stay on the lines of what is this uh, consciousness? Okay, this consciousness is outside reason. It's it's outside of reason and. Senses. Okay, so let me give you um, an Islamic thinker's perspective. I think he. I always try to coin the thinkers that I that I believe put it the most beautifully. Okay, so uh, one Islamic thinker in particular said, "Look, when you were born, you trusted your senses. Okay, if you touched something hot, you believed it was hot. If you saw something that was large, you believed it was large. If you uh, had any experience from your senses, if you tasted something that was sweet for you, it was sweet." Okay. Then he says, as you grew older, the intellect usurps the authority of the senses. The senses are no longer your uh, superior authority. The intellect now tells the senses what is right and wrong. So for instance, um, if you see a shadow, your eyes tell you that this shadow is not moving. However, your intellect tells you that as the sun goes through the certain phases phases uh, and the earth go through certain phases, that shadow is moving right now. Your eyes simply cannot detect it. Your eyes cannot detect the motion. Your mind is telling you that the senses are wrong and we believe the mind over the senses. Okay, so it looks like the sun is going around the earth. The mind tells us, no, that's an illusion. Nobody's going to trust the senses over the mind. Okay, the mind usurps the senses. Now, this Islamic thinker is asking us now, what if something tomorrow comes and usurps the authority of the mind, the intellect? And he says, look, there is such a thing. Okay, so let me make it even more simpler, sim simple by giving you uh, Leibniz's uh, um, example. Leibniz says, imagine I was really small and I was walking around inside your mind. I was walking around inside your mind, okay? And I would see everything that's mechanically true about your brain. I would see blood flowing. I would see gray matter. I would see neurons firing. I would see you in a certain brain state shifting from one brain state to another. I would see all sorts of activity. However, no matter how intelligent I am, no matter how intellectual I am, or how much, uh, how empirical I am, no matter how, how scientific I am, I will never know anything about your consciousness, your thoughts, your emotions. I will know nothing about the mind. Much less will I know anything about the contents of your mind. I will not know anything about the contents of your mind. So what these Islamic thinkers and these, these Western thinkers are saying is, look, there is something above the intellect as well, because... If there was not, if the intellect was supreme, then the, the intellect would be able to know about this conscious experience, this intuitive experience. Okay, So the question is, is science and reason absolute? The answer is a resounding no. Why? The hard problem of consciousness. There's something outside, outside of science. There's something outside of the intellect that the intellect and science cannot grasp. Okay, What is this thing? Well, it's very hard to define because it's very unique. Okay, so let me let's talk. Let's try to understand why it's so unique. Okay, let's talk about the beetle in the box. And again, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. Remember the first time when you saw a dog? We pointed to the dog, that animal, and we said, "That's a dog." And you learn to associate the word "dog" with that animal. Okay, uh, Descartes explains it quite beautifully, but I'm not going to give his explanation. It's a bit complicated. Then you see, I don't know, you see the sun, we point at it, we say, that's the sun. Then we give names to every creature and every object in the world. And every object, you learned its name in this fashion. Okay. Now, there are some exceptions. Like, for instance, I can, I can tell you about a triangle and I can liken a triangle to a square. They have lots of things in common. But your, your experience of triangle, your understanding of triangle is residing on those experiences of square okay so all our ideas in our mind come from these experiences we've had like we talked about earlier we've seen a we've seen gold we've seen a mountain we've compounded it together okay but a simple idea can no longer be broken down any further that's why it's so important that we believe we can only believe we can only accept a god that is one 
We cannot accept a God that is more than one. Okay, so because there, there are many arguments to this, but before you, before you could dream up anything, you have to start with a first. Okay, so that's why, you know, a lot of times we say that we get an objection. When we say the monotheism was first, some people say, no, pagan religions are older. No, that's impossible. Before you can believe in two gods, you first have to know about one, okay? But I don't want to go off topic, okay? Let's return back to the topic about the beetle in the box. Everything you ever learned about, you learned it by somebody. And again, I'm putting it in a nutshell. Generally pointing to it, you have an experience of it, and then we give it a name, okay? But what about your consciousness? Consciousness has never been pointed to. When I tell a scientist or a, a rational thinker that... I'm experiencing something in my mind. He believes me, not because he's rational or scientific. He believes me because of his own intuitive experience, his own bias. He has, he's had the experience of mind. He has had this experience of having a mind. That's the only reason why he believes me. Now picture this. Imagine I was the only human being in the world. And all of you were robotic scientists. You're the perfect robotic scientists. And you were to come and experiment on me because you found that I was peculiar. I'm very different than the rest of you. And you were to pinch my arm. And I were to say, ow, ouch, that hurt. You pinched my arm. Now, these scientific robots would, be, would say, look, when we pinched him, we saw the fiber C. Let's call it fiber C, fiber A, fiber D, whatever you want. Send a signal up into the brain. And then his brain changed from one state to another. However, when he says, Ouch, and I feel this pain. We don't have no idea what he's talking about. We have no idea of what he was referring to. That would be, these robots would be supremely scientific and rational, yet they would know nothing about this internal experience. The only reason why you know about my external, my internal experience is because you are sharing in it. Okay, now I can give you guys many examples of this, and um, but I, I don't want to make this video too long and complicated. Okay, remember, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Okay, so just to recap, one, every simple idea you've ever experienced in your life exists out there. And God is a simple idea. He's one. When somebody says Trinity, I cannot verify that. I have no experience of Trinity. However, I do have this innate experience of God or else I wouldn't be able to talk to you about God. Just like a, bl a blind man can never talk to you about the color red. He can never truly talk to you about the color red. He can only give you lip service. Okay, so I'm going to make this video a little bit long because I want to explain the phenomenon of lip service versus real understanding. Because I, I can hear certain objections already because I've heard them a million times. Now, please remember this idea has been cross-examined for thousands of years literally thousands of years okay now philosophers we don't all agree but theists we all agree on this idea okay we do all accept this idea many theists are not aware of this idea but if you're asking me why i believe in god this is one of the major reasons why i do believe in god and this is why i believe i'm certain in my belief in god i, I personally i like to say like um, many many individuals throughout history have said as well that i don't believe in god i know god I don't believe some people believe in God, yes, and I respect that that people have a belief in God. But I feel that I know God, just like I know the color red, just like I know all my experiences of simple ideas. Okay, so let's talk about John Searle's Chinese room experiment. Now, John Searle is a modern philosopher, a highly respected philosopher, and he gave this experience to prove that why robots will never be conscious. Okay, so I'm not going to be using it for this for this very same reason, but it's it's something along those lines. Okay, let me give you the Chinese room exper experiment. Okay, picture a room. Okay, you're outside of this room and you're looking at this door, and you know that if you open this door, you're going to enter a room. Now, in this door, there's a little slit where you can pass messages through the door back and forth. Okay, now I'm a Chinese speaking person. I write on a Chinese. I, I write on a paper. I write. Hello, my name is Faraz. How are you today? And I slide the message through the door. Then there's a message sliding back the other way that says, Hello, Faraz. How are you? My name is Pete. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. And then I write back, Hello, Pete. How long have you been in this room? I find it very curious. How are you today? And I'm writing him whatever message. And then I slide it back through the door. And now Pete writes me back. Well, I've been in this room my whole life, actually. I've uh, enjoyed very much and I, I wish to stay here for the rest of my days. 
Now, regardless of whatever dialogue we're having, we're having this fun dialogue back and forth. Okay. Then one day I open the door. When I open the door, I meet Pete for the first time. And Pete has this manual inside his room. And I discover that Pete doesn't speak any Chinese whatsoever. Pete tells me, no, I don't speak Chinese at all. I only speak English. And then I say, Pete, how did we have this amazing dialogue back and forth? You spoke to me in perfect Chinese. He says, for us, I have a manual here. Every time you give me a Chinese letter or a Chinese sentence or a Chinese word, I have all these possible combinations I can send you back. I have an algorithm that I follow. I look, I find the corresponding message in my manual and then my manual gives me several possible responses I could send back to you. And I'm like, wow, Pete, you really had me fooled. I thought you speak perfect Chinese. Now me and Pete are the same in appearance. Pete doesn't understand a word of Chinese. He didn't understand anything about our dialogue. He has no idea of anything about me. In his mind, Chinese is gibberish. Okay? This is the same way a vending machine works. This is the same way a robot works. A robot has no idea. He has no conscious experience. Now, in appearance, me and Pete are the same. But we are only the same in appearance. I'm having an, an internal experience that's only known via intuition that's outside of Pete's experience. Pete has no idea about this Chinese experience. Okay, He has no idea of this intuitive experience that I'm having. We are only the same in appearance. This is very profound and very important, something to reflect on. Okay, So to recap, have you ever had an idea in your mind, like Descartes says, no matter how bizarre a drawing you make, all those bizarre items you put on that page, they're all something you've experienced in the past. You cannot draw or think of anything that you have not experienced in the past, okay? This, many, many great thinkers agree to this, okay? Including atheist David Hume. Now, my question to you is, is there any idea in your mind that you've ever come across that you have not experienced, is not a collage, it's nothing you've experienced in the world, a simple idea, and is also not a collage, that you've made up in your mind, you'll find that there's no such idea. So how can we even talk about God if you have not experienced God? How can we talk about the soul if you're also not having this inter in interior, dial interior experience? We are all experiencing God all the time. We are all experiencing God all the time. It is a simple question of reductionism. When you reduce everything in the dunya, everything in the world, there's nothing in the world and there's nothing left in the mind. Then you will know God. You will know God. Um, th this pure, simple idea that you could not uh, object to because we're talking about it literally right now. Now, I can imagine there's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of dialogue back and forth. I hope it stays respectful. If it does, I'm happy to continue this dialogue with you all. But uh, please remember, these, these ideas have been cross-examined throughout the ages. Theists, we agree. Atheists, they don't agree. But I would like to hear what your argument is because I've never heard a good argument against these theories. In my opinion, we have directly experienced God. Now remember, I'm talking about cons consciousness or soul, not the contents of soul or slash consciousness. This internal experience is beyond intellect and empirical evidence. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it wasn't too, too much. And uh, hopefully we have a, a productive dialogue. Thank you.